Yes. Uh, let's give him a nice welcome. Corey, you're on. It's, it's hard to believe we're still here in 2021 discussing and entertaining many of the allegations against James Longstreet's performance at the Battle of Gettysburg. But alas, here we are. Since the release of my book in February of 2019, many at signing and speaking events have asked me variations of the same question. Didn't Longstreet drag his feet and sulk at Gettysburg? Wasn't he insubordinate to Lee? Before going into some of the details with them, usually my first response is, well, how much time do you have? I truly enjoy getting into the details and attempting to walk people through how so many of the major controversial moments on the Confederate side at Gettysburg have become so distorted over the years. I often suggest that people be very wary of those who throw out blanket statements about Longstreet's Gettysburg performance, like for instance, the extremely persistent Longstreet should have attacked in the morning on July 2nd. There's so much to unpack in addressing a statement like that and many others. Indeed, I think the comparison between Longstreet and Getty, at Gettysburg and an onion is appropriate. One must peel back the onion layers when addressing most, if not all of the controversial moments involving Longstreet's actions at the battle. And yet trying to reason with people who are satisfied with blanket explanations less often produces genuine headway and more often universal frustration on both sides. In all actuality though, wading through much of the detail is not entirely necessary at least not when addressing claims that essentially label Longstreet as Lee's Judas Iscariot at Gettysburg. Most studies of the battle over the decades have more or less portrayed Longstreet as either sulking or insubordinate, or in some cases, both. This longstanding and misleading portrayal has often naturally led to the conclusion that Longstreet was essentially thwarting Lee at every turn during the battle, whether the commanding general actually realized it or not. Not only is this a fanciful overture, but Lee deserves much more credit as a general. To claim Lee would have been unable to recognize intentional apathy or blatant insubordination is bad enough. But to suggest he was extremely frustrated by these alleged actions and decided to do nothing about it during the battle, or afterwards is even worse. And not to mention an utter absurdity. Indeed, it is more than a little ironic that some historians who have lambasted Longstreet's alleged actions at Gettysburg with the intention of protecting Lee have actually produced an interpretation that accomplishes quite the opposite. Namely, a Robert E. Lee who was so inept at Gettysburg that he retained and trusted a general who he knew was sabotaging his plans. Think about that for a minute. Indeed, one of the main reasons why I was very much looking forward to speaking to you this evening was to forcefully make the argument that historians and students of the war need not continue down this path in the years to come. Most past histories of the battle, whether authors and readers have realized it or not, have truly been wedded to greater and lesser degrees to many of the same arguments the anti-Longstreet group made in the post-war years. This was the same group that came up with the sunrise attack theory for the July 2nd battle based on no evidence whatsoever. And yet many historians have seemingly gone on to banish that complete fabrication from their mind while finding it completely satisfactory to entertain many of their other arguments made in the 1880s, 1890s, and beyond. With that said, the two questions I think everyone needs to contemplate are, one, if Longstreet was so bad at Gettysburg, why did Lee fail to relieve or transfer Longstreet immediately after the battle while ensuring that he never served in the Army of Northern Virginia again? And two, why did the anti-Longstreet partisans choose to wait until after Lee's death to begin their campaign against Longstreet's Gettysburg performance and his wartime record more generally? Please keep those questions in mind as we go through the presentation tonight. For now, I'll just say that the love and trust, both professionally and personally, that continued unabated between Lee and Longstreet right up until the former's death is undoubtedly both the easiest and strongest argument one can make when addressing the case against Longstreet at Gettysburg. Speaking of arguments made by the anti, post-war anti-Longstreet group, many of them still manage to rear their head in our modern times. I recently happened upon one of them on social media. 
one that I've seen many times in the past, but perhaps not so forcibly. A gentleman went on at great length using a strategy of criticizing Longstreet's Gettysburg performance that I think has perhaps been the most persistent one used by the anti-Longstreet crowd since the early 1870s. It's easy to pick out with the individual typically starting their argument with, yes, but Lee intended Longstreet too. I see fervent critics employ this strategy all the time and quite effectively, I might add. More often than not, I've seen it disarm the other side, causing them to give ground needlessly. Undoubtedly, it is an alluring mode of argument that has been deployed against Longstreet's actions at Gettysburg for well over a century because it's so seemingly convincing and persuasive on the surface. Tonight, we will examine several of these Lee intended arguments concerning Longstreet's Gettysburg performance, dividing them into three categories. Some of Lee's actual intentions supported by the primary source record, false intentions unsupported by evidence but continually perpetuated, and intentions that were potentially sought after but because of events and circumstances during the battle went unfulfilled. To start off, we'll begin with some of Lee's actual intentions at Gettysburg that either concern or directly involve Longstreet's actions, tactical suggestions, or his ability to achieve success. Many of these intentions are not ones that Longstreet critics often want to discuss, since they do not fit into their narrative that Longstreet was foremost to blame for the Confederate loss at Gettysburg. Lee's first crucial intention concerns Confederate Lieutenant General Richard Ewell's Second Corps on the night of July 1st and into the morning of July 2nd. In most studies of the battle, it's either not pointed out enough or in some cases not at all, that Lee was uncertain as to what should be done with Ewell's Corps after the July 1st battle. Upon pushing the Federals south through the town of Gettysburg during the late afternoon and early evening hours of July 1st, Ewell's men eventually took up position just north and northeast of the Federals' reconstituted line anchored on Cemetery Hill. E.P. Alexander, Longstreet's principal artillery officer at Gettysburg, amply pointed out in the post-war years that Ewell's position was extremely poor and could never be used to great advantage. Lee's actions on the night of July 1st and the morning of July 2nd demonstrate that the commanding general thought the same way about Ewell's position and had intentions to make a change. During the overnight hours and into the morning of July 2nd, Lee sent two staff officers, Charles Marshall and Charles Venable, to talk with Ewell about the possibility of moving his corps around to the right to either support Longstreet's attack or to potentially maneuver the entire army further south between Washington, D.C. and the Federal Army in line with Longstreet's tactical suggestion on the evening of July 1st. Indeed, one of Ewell's aides, George Campbell Brown, alleged that Lee asked him during the overnight hours to tell Ewell, quote, not to become so much involved as to be unable readily to extricate his troops. I have not decided to fight here and may probably draw off my right flank so as to get between the enemy in Washington and Baltimore and force them to attack us in position, unquote. Evidence suggests that Lee also considered initiating the July 2nd attack from Ewell's front along with sending Marshall and Venable to discuss these options with Ewell and other Second Corps officers, Lee also met with Ewell in person on at least two occasions between the overnight hours of July 1st and the morning of July 2nd. The last meeting between Lee and Ewell did not conclude until as late as the 10 a.m. hour on July 2nd. When Lee finally decided to leave Ewell where he was, initiate the attack with Longstreet's Corps on the extreme Confederate right, and have the Second Corps take simultaneous action to stop federal units on Cemetery and Culpsill from being shifted against Longstreet's assault. The importance of this particular intention concerning what to do with Yule's Corps cannot be overstated. First, it shows that Lee was not obsessing over tactical particulars during the overnight hours of July 1st, but was actually making more fundamental decisions about how to deal with the Federals on July 2nd. Secondly, it shows Lee likely at least considered Longstreet's tactical suggestion to draw off the Federal's right flank, perhaps more than many historians have represented in the past. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, Lee's indecision, indecision over what to do with Ewell's Corps 
immediately draws into serious question any contention that Lee was anywhere near ready to attack early on July 2nd, but more on that topic later. Yule's orders on July 2nd to take sufficient simultaneous action against the federal right to at the very least hold federal units on that sector of the field in place was yet another important intention by Lee, which was clearly spelled out in the commanding generals after battle reports. The key word here is simultaneous. Yes, Yule did eventually launch an attack against East Cemetery Hill on July 2nd, but this assault happened several hours after Longstreet's attack began. Yule's very late attack was neither Lee's intention nor in line with his orders. In fact, during Longstreet's attack, Yule did very little more than ineffectively trade cannon fire with the Federals, allowing Meade to strip most of his right to reinforce his left, serving to further wear down and blunt Longstreet's attack. Additionally, it's only fair to note on this topic that there's no evidence the commanding general made an attempt to check on Yule, who was new to Corps Command to ensure his orders are being carried out as intended. The importance of Lee's unfulfilled intention on July 2nd for Yule to demonstrate or attack simultaneously with Longstreet is yet another significant one that cannot be overstated and that it further inhibited the potential of the First Corps to achieve success against the Federal Cemetery Ridge position. Also on the topic of support to Longstreet's July 2nd attack was Lee's intention for Richard Anderson's Third Corps Division to continue the assault northward after the First Corps divisions of John Bell Hood and Lafayette McClaws had fully engaged. With Longstreet's third division under the command of George Pickett not arriving near the battlefield until the early evening hours of July 2nd, Lee gave Longstreet Anderson's division from AP Hill's Corps. However, there's no evidence tactical authority over Anderson was ever given to Longstreet. And so once the divisions of Hood and McClaws had fully engaged, with the latter successfully piercing Federal General Daniel Sickles' advanced position at the Joseph Sheriffy Peach Orchard and setting its sights on Cemetery Ridge, it was Anderson's turn to continue the attack. Initially, this transition worked as Lee had intended, with the brigades of Cadmus Wilcox, da David Lang, and Ambrose Wright fully engaging, with the latter even achieving a brief foothold on Cemetery Ridge. With that said, as Wright looked rearward for support Parnot Posey's and William Mahone's brigades were nowhere in sight, and so he was soon forced to withdraw. To this day, it is one of the mysteries of the battle why only three of Anderson's five brigades fully engaged on July 2nd. It was clearly Lee's intention that Anderson serve as the replacement for Pickett and continue the attack. Yet as the Confederates under Wright seemingly began to achieve some degree of success against the federal position, no additional units from the division came to his support. Perhaps most strangely, all of this action happened not only right in front of Hill and Anderson, but also Lee. Who, as we know from British observer Arthur Fremantle's account of the battle, was located with the Third Corps throughout Longstreet's July 2nd attack. Much like Yule's lack of support to the First Corps assault, the partial support provided by Anderson's division served to further limit Longstreet's potential to achieve more substantial success during the second day's battle. To address the next of Lee's actual intentions at Gettysburg, we must rewind the tape a bit, so to speak, on the second day. To set the scene, it was around the 3 p.m. hour when Longstreet's two divisions of Hood and McClaws made it to their attack jump off points on Warfield Ridge, the southern extension of Seminary Ridge. Soon thereafter, Longstreet spoke with both McClaws and Joseph Kershaw, one of McClaws' brigade commanders, and reiterated the Confederate High Command's mistaken belief that there was no major body of federal troops positioned south of Cemetery Hill, and that the 1st Corps divisions would be entirely on the federal army's left flank. Minutes later, Long minutes later McClaws received an order from Longstreet to open the attack. However, as McClaws and Kershaw soon discovered, there was actually a very large body of federal troops in their front along the Emmitsburg Road at the Peach Orchard. Reporting this unexpected reality to Longstreet, McClaws and the 1st Corps commander proceeded to exchange a series of notes via a staff officer 
with Longstreet repeatedly ordering McClaws to commence the attack. Many historians over the decades have used this scene during the battle to criticize Longstreet for seemingly single-handedly ordering McClaws to attack without acknowledging the unexpected and changed battlescape. What these historians have either been unaware of or have ignored is the fact that in, post, in the post-war accounts of Lafayette McClaws and one of Longstreet's aides, Osmond Latrobe, we learned that Lee was then with Longstreet and joined in the attack order. Once McClaws was informed that Lee seconded the attack order, he immediately prepared to lead his men forward, but then received a last minute note to stand down. Lee and Longstreet had now realized that their understanding of the federal position was inaccurate. In all actuality, it had never been accurate, a topic we'll cover later. With the day approaching the 4 p.m. hour, Lee and Longstreet then set about changing the attack plan at the last minute. The attack would still be directed up the Emmitsburg Road. However, because the federal line now extended further to the left than anticipated, Hood's division was instructed to skirt past McClaws, extending the Confederate battle line further to the right. Hood would now open the attack, not McClaws. As events bore out, Hood's division would effectively be split in two. One half attempted to carry out Lee and Longstreet's order to attack up the Emmitsburg Road, while the other advanced toward a federal line that bent well back from the Peach Orchard onto Houck's Ridge and into Devil's Den. To recap and stress the importance of this particular topic, we learned that not only was it Longstreet's intention, for McClaw's division to open the assault soon after it reached its attack jump off points. But it was also Lee's. Narratives of the battle over the decades have often described this scene without Lee's presence. But we learned from McClaw, McClaw's and Latrobe's accounts that the commanding general was indeed on hand and joined in Longstreet's attack order. The last of Lee's major intentions that is borne out by the primary source record and Warren's discussion was his plan to advance main artillery line support with the Confederate infantry on July 3rd during the picket Pettigrew Trimble charge. Lee's after battle report suggests that he considered advance artillery either behind or on the flank of the attacking column to be the assault's main resource for support. As underscored in a pre-infantry assault note to E.P. Alexander, Longstreet was well aware of Lee's desire to advance artillery with the infantry and the attack commander made that intention clear in his instructions to the young artillery officer. That said, unforeseen events and the impracticality of advancing main artillery line support ultimately precluded this intention from being carried out. First of all, and perhaps of greatest significance, was the fact that by the end of the Confederates' massive pre-attack bombardment, their guns were running low on ammunition. Additionally, they had no prospect of replenishing their ammunition in time for the attack given that Lee's chief of artillery, William Pendleton, had disastrously moved the reserve ammunition too far to the rear. Coupled with this reality was the sheer impracticality of advancing the main artillery line with the infantry attack. As E.P. Alexander explained at great length in both of his post-war memoirs, Fighting for the Confederacy and Military Memoirs of a Confederate. Alexander amply explained that in advancing the artillery between Seminary and Cemetery Ridge, the gunners would experience significant sighting difficulties given the deceptively unpredictable terrain on that sector of the battlefield and the fact that their vision would be largely obscured by smoke. Furthermore, Alexander reasoned that firing over the heads of infantry at close range demoralizes troops and believed that advanced artillery was more easily exposed to counter artillery, rifle and sharpshooter fire or could even be caught up in a repulse and captured. Despite these ammunition and impracticality issues, Alexander did not disregard his orders. In fact, he took the initiative in cobbling together nine mobile howitzers, intending to move these faster moving guns in front of Pickett's infantry and just short of federal rifle range to fire a few rounds before the infantry passed in front of them. Alexander decided not to inform Longstreet of his howitzer plan in advance hoping to surprise the general by rolling the guns out onto the field just as Pickett began his approach. Unfortunately for Alexander, he also did not inform someone else about the plan, William Pendleton. Pendleton moved the howitzers before the attack and Alexander's plan was completely scrapped. Alexander dropped the news of a lack of artillery ammunition 
and the absence of any significant advanced artillery support on Longstreet just as Pickett's division stepped off toward the federal center. These two consequential news items were what caused Longstreet to admit to Alexander that he did not want to make the attack, that he believed it would fail and could not see how it could possibly succeed. That said, despite Longstreet's serious reservations and Alexander essentially providing Longstreet with newfound reasons to argue for calling off the attack, the post-battle source record shows that the attack commander understood Lee had set his mind on the assault and expected it to be carried out. Indeed, in Longstreet's after battle report, written just weeks after the battle, and certainly read and reviewed by Lee, the attack commander candidly stated at that moment in the July 3rd battle, quote, I found then that our supply of ammunition was so short that the batteries could not reopen. The order for this attack, which I could not favor under better auspices, would have been revoked had I felt that I had that privilege. That's in Longstreet's official report. Moving on from some of Lee's actual intentions at Gettysburg that concern or involve Longstreet, we now turn to some unsupported and supposed Lee intentions that Longstreet critics have frequently advanced since the 1870s. The first and perhaps most well-known of, Lee, of Lee's alleged intentions was the July 2nd at, at sunrise attack theory, which was admis initially advanced by ex-Confederates William Pendleton and Jubal Early shortly after the former commanding general's death in 1870. This theory held that Lee had intended for Longstreet to attack the federal left during the very early morning hours of July 2nd. There has never been any evidence to support this contention. As early as the mid 1870s, several other ex-Confederate officers to include Walter Taylor, Charles Venable, Charles Marshall, Armistead Long, and John Fairfax, wrote letters to Longstreet confirming they had no idea what Pendleton and Early were talking about and had never heard of any such plan. Most significant in further helping to discount the Sunrise attack allegation was, perhaps surprisingly, William Pendleton's very own Gettysburg after battle report, written in September 1863. Several paragraphs in, Pe in Pendleton's report describe a Confederate high command on July 2nd, scrambling throughout the morning and early afternoon hours, trying to gather details about the federal position, getting the men to their attack jump off points and preparing for the assault. In short, they were engaging in necessary activities and completing them as quickly as events and circumstances allowed. As outlandish and unsupported as the sunrise attack claims turned out to be, a number of higher profile historians, who include Douglas Southall Freeman, unfortunately perpetuated this theory and passed it off as established fact well into the 20th century. Resultantly to this day, you'll still hear or see people ask the question, didn't Lee intend for Longstreet to attack at sunrise? Or wasn't Longstreet supposed to attack very early in the morning? Another claim Longstreet critics have frequently made over the decades was that Lee intended for his old war horse to be at the head of the First Corps column during its march to the extreme Confederate right on the afternoon of July 2nd. They claim that Lee never ordered his engineer, Captain Samuel Johnston, to guide the First Corps on a concealed path to its attack jump off points. They further and oddly allege that since Longstreet was not at the head of the column, during the march, he somehow abdicated command of his two divisions to Johnston. In addressing these assertions, we must first begin with establishing the fact that not only did Johnston lead the Confederates' initial early morning reconnaissance, which attempted to discover fundamental details about the federal position and the location of the federal left, but he also conducted additional reconnaissance duties on the morning and early afternoon of July 2nd to include one specifically to identify a concealed marching route to the right for Longstreet's men. Additionally, as confirmed in Lafayette McClaw's post-war writings on this topic, and even in Longstreet's official report written just weeks after the battle, Johnson was indeed designated and ordered by Lee to guide the First Corps column. Given that Johnson had conducted a reconnaissance mission specifically to examine the roads to the right in an attempt to find a concealed route as ordered by Lee, it's most rational he was the best logical choice to guide the column. 
Lastly, critics' allegation that Longstreet essentially relinquished command of his corps to Johnston during the march, simply because the corps commander was not at the head of the column, is an altogether baseless assertion. Not only is it clear Lee ordered Johnston to guide the column, but it was never mandatory for a corps commander to be at the head of a marching column. It has also since been well established that Longstreet was near the middle of the column during the march, and for, the most, and for most of that time, riding together with General Lee. If Lee thought Longstreet was supposed to be leading the column or felt some unease as to where the first corps commander was then located, as commanding general, surely he would have made his concerns apparent to Longstreet. Furthermore, Lee would have read and reviewed Longstreet's after battle report assertion that said, quote, engineers sent out by the commanding general and myself guided us, unquote. If that was an inaccurate statement, clearly establishing Johnston's leading role during the march, surely Lee would have insisted to be changed or stricken from the official record, which he did not do. The next false statement about Lee's intentions to be addressed is perhaps the most pervasive general untruth about Longstreet's July 2nd attack. The assertion that Little Round Top was the Confederates' designated objective. Despite how excellent and powerful the Gettysburg movie is, truth be told, it has probably played a very significant role in further cementing this false claim by focusing almost entirely on the fight for Little Round Top during the July 2nd portion of the film. Though there was certainly fierce fighting on Little Round Top, and undoubtedly a number of, story, number of stories of bravery and heroism, making the jump to claim that Lee's intention on July 2nd was seizing Little Round Top demonstrates a fundamental misunderstanding of the Confederate assault's objective. In all actuality, <clears throat> Lee's objective on July 2nd was never the Round Tops. Rather, Lee's orders were to attack up the Emmitsburg Road. The battle in the Little Round Top sector of the field happened because of a number of reasons outside the scope of this presentation. Lee's attack up the Emmitsburg Road orders and his, and his two after battle reports, especially his July 31st, 1863 report, written just weeks after the battle, confirm Lee's goal was to seize the Joseph Sheriffy Peach Orchard and to use it as an artillery platform to gain a foothold on Cemetery Ridge. Of greatest significance in confirming this point was when Lee wrote in his July 31st report, quote, in front of General Longstreet, the enemy held a position from which if he could be driven, it was thought our artillery could be used to advantage in assailing the more elevated ground beyond and thus enable us to reach the crest of the ridge. That officer was directed to endeavor to, to carry this position. After a severe struggle, Longstreet succeeded in getting possession of and holding the desired ground. Unquote. The desired ground was the peach orchard, and the ridge was Cemetery Ridge. As unbelievable as it may sound, given that so much focus has been put on Little Round Top over the decades, the Rocky Hill was never the Confederates' objective on July 2nd. It's often necessary to stress this point when some Longstreet critics attempt to make the argument that if Longstreet had only attacked earlier, he would have found Little Round Top undefended or lightly defended and would probably have seized it easily. An appropriate rebuttal would be that, first of all, depending on the time in the morning, Longstreet would have found more than federal signalmen on Little Round Top. But of even more importance is drawing attention to the fact that the Confederate High Command sites were always on Cemetery Hill as a result of Samuel Johnston's misleading early morning reconnaissance report <clears throat> that claimed the federal left was located there at Cemetery Hill or close by. Lee's morning instructions to Lafayette McClaws to form his division perpendicular to the Emmitsburg Road. Longstreet's repeated afternoon instructions to John Bell Hood to attack up the Emmitsburg Road. And of course, the content in Lee's after battle reports confirm that Little Round Top was never the objective. The final alleged Lee intention that Longstreet critics often bring up is their claim that on July 3rd, Cadmus Wilcox and David Lang's 3rd Corps Brigades were to advance concurrently with George Pickett's division to protect its right flank. I believe this assertion was very likely born out of many historians falling into the trap of writing about how they would have executed the Pickett Pettigrew Trimble charge, since there's no evidence anywhere that Lee instructed Longstreet to advance Wilcox and Lang 
simultaneously with Pickett. The best evidence we have that provides some clarity on the Wilcox Lang topic is an account from one of Pickett's aides, Robert Bright, who was sent to find Longstreet during the attack to request support. During his exchange with the staff officer, Longstreet asked where the troops were that, he, that had been posted on Pickett's flank. Bright told Longstreet to look over his shoulder, whereby the attack commander saw the struggling or withdrawing commands of Pettigrew and Trimble on Pickett's left. British observer Arthur Fremantle arrived on the scene at that moment, and Longstreet went on to inform him that the attack had been repulsed and was essentially over, while pointing to Pettigrew's and Trimble's men. Longstreet then turned to Bright and instructed the staff officer to tell Pickett what he had just said to Fremantle about the attack's enfeebled state. As Bright turned to ride away, Longstreet called him back, pointed to the right, and said that Wilcox and Lang were available, quote, in that peach orchard, unquote, and that Pickett could request their assistance if needed. Bright's account strongly suggests that Longstreet was well aware Wilcox and Lang had not advanced with Pickett, was cognizant of their current location and then idle state, and that Pickett could call on them if he required support. Indeed, there's no intimation in Longstreet's dialogue with Bright that the attack commander was under the impression Wilcox and Lang's brigade should then have been advancing with Pickett's division. On the contrary, he knew where they were and that they were idle. A few of Pickett's staff officers would eventually reach Wilcox to request his and Lang's support, and the two brigades would ultimately advance ineffectively. While Pickett had been forced to execute a series of left obliques to close the gap that existed between his and Pettigrew's division, Wilcox and Lang essentially advanced straight ahead and were, were unable to locate Pickett. On top of that issue, the two brigades, like Pickett's division, were subjected to murderous federal artillery fire, along with flanking fire from George Stannard's Vermonters. Interestingly enough, in a conversation with Lang prior to the brigade's ill-fated advance, Wilcox admitted that he would only go forward under protest, along with several other Confederate officers on July 2nd to include Lewis Armistead, Richard Garnett, William Wofford, A.P. Hill, and of course, Longstreet. Wilcox neither liked the looks of the Federal's strong and well-defended center, nor the Confederates' chances for success against it. Beyond Longstreet critics advancing their unsupported supposition that Lee intended for Wilcox and Lang's men to advance simultaneously with Pickett, it's unknown what they believe a mere 1,700 additional men who had already seen significant action on July 2nd would have actually contributed to the July 3rd attack. It's worth pointing out that the federal line extended well south of where Pickett, Wilcox, and Lang were advancing. If Wilcox and Lang were to, to have attempted to protect Pickett's flank, who would have protected Wilcox's? Some would probably say Hood's and McClaw's battered men. However, there's also no evidence those divisions were assigned a role in the attack. Unfortunately, some historians' conjecture on the July 3rd attack has not stopped with Wilcox, Lang, Hood, and McClaw's, but has grown to even more outlandish proportions, like the second wave theory, for instance, whereby Lee apparently had several Confederate brigades waiting in the wings to advance shortly after Pickett, Pettigrew, and Trimble stepped off toward Cemetery Ridge. On the contrary, the primary source record suggests that the principal methods of intended support for the attack were limited to, first and foremost, advanced artillery behind or on the flank of the infantry column, and secondly, infantry support, if and only if, Pickett, Pettigrew, and Trimble achieved some kind of notable, noticeable success against the federal center. From unsupported claims about Lee's intentions, we now move on to the most prolific category of the commanding general's supposed intentions, namely those that were potentially sought after, but due to events and circumstances during the battle went unfulfilled. I saved this category until last because it, is, because it is the most commonly observed tactic in present day debates. Essentially what I found is that Longstreet critics seem to have a bit of an immovable fixation when alleging that Longstreet should have arrived earlier on July 1st and attacked earlier on July 2nd and 3rd. In discussing these topics with Longstreet critics, you frequently hear the following nomenclature, if only, should have, and the ever familiar Lee intended for. 
Indeed, Lee probably intended for a lot of things at Gettysburg. However, as we will examine this and discuss here, many of those intentions were upset by factors largely out of Lee or Longstreet's control. It's well beyond time to focus less on the Confederate High Command's supposed intentions at Gettysburg and much more on the substantiated realities they faced. We begin with the easiest allegation to debunk. The longstanding claim that Longstreet was slow and arrived late to the battlefield on July 1st. On this topic, Longstreet critics have almost always turned to a post-war account written by Second Corps aide James Power Smith, who alleged that when Lee was considering making an attack on Cemetery Hill during the evening hours of July 1st, he turned to Longstreet, who had ridden ahead of his divisions and had just arrived at the front and asked if his corps was available to support such an attack. Longstreet allegedly pointed to a dust cloud northwest of town on the Chambersburg Pike and reported they were not. However, he offered to push up his leading brigades with all possible haste if necessary. Smith then alleged that Lee said he regretted his people were not yet up, which Longstreet critics have frequently employed ever since to maintain Longstreet was a slow marcher and Lee was annoyed by his unavailability. In all actuality, there was a simple reason Longstreet's divisions of Hood and McClaws were not up at that time, a reason likely known and caused by Lee himself. During the morning hours of July 1st, Lee and Longstreet initially rode together along the Chambersburg Pike toward Gettysburg until they reached Greenwood. There, the generals ran into a bit of a predicament. Richard Yule's Second Corps Division under Edward Johnson, along with the Corps' lengthy wagon train, were coming down from the north and arrived in Greenwood simultaneously with Longstreet's two divisions. Aware that other portions of Ewell's Corps were nearing Gettysburg further to the east, Lee instructed Longstreet to allow Johnson and the wagon train to pass in front of the First Corps in an attempt to more rapidly concentrate the entire Second Corps. Lee's decision was reasonable. However, it effectively sealed the deal in further delaying Longstreet's men on the bottlenecked Chambersburg Pike precluding them from reaching the battlefield until the late evening hours. Coupled with this reality, the commanding general realistically had a number of fresh or semi-fresh second and third corps units to, an, to attempt an attack on Cemetery Hill on the evening of July 1st, if desired, namely the divisions of Jubal Early, Edward Johnson, William Dorsey Pender, and Richard Anderson. Indeed, Richard Ewell initially reported to Lee that an attack on the hill might be possible if supported by A.P. Hill's Corps. Ultimately, the attack never happened for several often discussed reasons, some of them more plausible than others. That said, what is clear on this topic is that Lee may have intended for Longstreet's divisions to be available on the evening of July 1st to make an attempt against Cemetery Hill. However, the cause of the First Corps' absence at that time is entirely explainable, reasonable, and ultimately free of any, any innate slowness on Longstreet's part. We now progress to what has been far and away the most cited of Lee's alleged intentions at Gettysburg, namely that he intended for the Confederate attack on July 2nd to have been executed much earlier in the day, perhaps in the early to mid morning hours. After the sunrise attack theory was debunked in the mid 1870s, post-war Longstreet critics pivoted to this subtler and ultimately more alluring allegation which has somehow managed to stand the test of time in a number of Civil War history circles. Critics continue to claim that because Lee did not adopt Longstreet's tactical suggestions on the evening of July 1st or the morning of July 2nd, the First Corps commander turned to sulking and dragging his feet. Resultantly, they maintain that Longstreet single-handedly delayed the Confederate attack beyond some so-called golden moments that would allegedly have proven more favorable for Southern success. Down through history, battles almost never go as intended. And for the Confederates on the second day at Gettysburg, plenty of unforeseen errors and occurrences precluded them from attacking before they ultimately did around the 4 p.m. hour. First, as I mentioned earlier, during the overnight hours of July 1st and well into the morning hours of July 2nd, Lee was uncertain about what to do with Ewell's Corps. Should Yule move around to the Confederate left or be le left in place on the right? Should Yule or Longstreet initiate the day's main attack? If initiated by Longstreet, how would Yule provide support? All of these questions were mulled over until the 10 a.m. hour 
when Lee finished an in-person meeting with Yule and finally decided to leave the second corps where it was on the right while ordering Yule to make a simultaneous demonstration to be converted into a real attack with Longstreet's main assault. Secondly, there were multiple reconnaissance missions during the morning hours. Not having Jeb Stewart, Lee relied on his engineer, Captain Samuel Johnston, along with Longstreet's engineer, Major John Clark, to conduct scouting and intelligence activities on the Army's right. Not only did Johnston lead the early morning reconnaissance mission that resulted in providing Lee with false intelligence about the location of the federal left flank, but Johnston also conducted additional scouting activities well into the late morning to early afternoon hours one of which was intended to find a concealed marching route to the extreme right. According to William Pendleton's after battle report, even as late as the noon hour, scouting activities and examinations of the front were conducted by other individuals to include Pendleton himself, another engineer, Colonel William Smith, E.P. Alexander, Longstreet, Lee, and others. So far, we have Lee not making a final decision about what to do with Yule until around 10 a.m and multiple reconnaissance missions ongoing up until the noon hour. In fact, in Lafayette McClaw's post-war account, he asserts that Samuel Johnston did not come to him to say he was ready to conduct his division on the march until 1 p.m. On top of these occurrences, we also have the reality that Lee did not issue Longstreet's attack orders until he had returned from Yule's front around 11 a.m. Once Longstreet received his attack orders, he then asked for Lee's permission to wait for Evander Law's brigade of, Long, of Hood's division, fully one eighth of his corps attack force that day before commencing his move to the extreme right. Lee expressly granted Longstreet's request. Law's brigade, which had been on picket duty at New Guilford, 24 miles to the west until 3 a.m. on July 2nd, set a grueling pace to reach the battlefield about 30 to 45 minutes after Longstreet made his request. With Law's arrival around 11.30 a.m. at the earliest, we still have those reconnaissance efforts ongoing, especially the one intended to fulfill Lee's order for Longstreet's column to march concealed to the extreme right. Let's just say most conservatively that Johnston finished his reconnaissance and informed McClaws he was ready to conduct his division forward at around 12 noon. It was only around the same time that Richard Anderson's Third Corps Division, essentially Pickett's replacement, though still apparently under A.P. Hill's command, was getting into position on the lower end of Seminary Ridge proper. Since Longstreet's two divisions were to form perpendicular to the Emmitsburg Road on the right of Anderson's division, naturally the Third Corps men would need to be anchored in position first. As stated, this move by Anderson was not completed until around 12 noon. We then come to the much discussed First Corps march to the right, which led to additional unforeseen and unintentional delays. On this topic, the fact of the matter is, is that it was apparent Lee's designated guide, Captain Samuel Johnston, either did not know where he was going, never found a concealed route during his late morning reconnaissance, or simply got lost because he led Longstreet's column to what would have been an exposed point near Black Horse Tavern, located just north of the Fairfield Road. Indeed, in the post-war years, McClaws, Lafayette McClaws, would reasonably describe Lee's concealed marching route order on July 2nd to be nothing more than a, quote, millstone around Longstreet's neck. Once halted at the tavern, McClaws and Johnston searched around the area to see if there was another nearby route that would serve to avoid the impasse. While in the meantime, Longstreet received several messages about the issue and proceeded to the front. Upon his arrival at the head of the column, Longstreet discussed the problem with McClaws and asked for suggestions, whereby the division commander told his chief that based on a personal reconnaissance he had conducted in the morning hours, the only way to proceed in a concealed manner was to countermarch and take an alternate route. Absent any reliable source evidence suggesting Longstreet was made aware of any other alternatives, he immediately ordered the countermarch. Thus, the entire march, including the time spent at Black Horse Tavern, was conducted sometime between the 12 noon and 3 p.m. hours. It was ultimately prolonged by several factors, namely, Johnston mistakenly leading the column to an exposed point, Longstreet not being made aware of a potential path across fields, 
located near the tavern that E.P. Alexander's guns had employed earlier in the day, and simply the amount of time it took to execute and complete the countermarch. The last unforeseen delay affecting Longstreet's time of assault on July 2nd occurred after his two divisions reached their attack jump off points on Warfield Ridge. As the divisions formed up, Longstreet discussed the attack plan with McClaws and other brigade level officers, reiterating the misconceived attack plan the Confederate High Command had formulated hours earlier <clears throat> based on false intelligence. That the divisions would be entirely on the federal left flank, there would be no one in their front and to attack up the Emmitsburg Road. Soon thereafter, Longstreet and Lee, who was then located with or nearby the first corps commander, instructed McClaws to open the attack. As discussed earlier, McClaws soon made the unexpected discovery that there was a large body of federal troops in his front, Daniel Sickles' Federal Third Corps. After exchanging a series of notes with McClaws, Lee and Longstreet caught on to the changed battlescape. Now they had to alter the attack plan at the last minute, leading to an additional delay of perhaps between 30 minutes to an hour. The main change in the attack plan involved moving Hood's division past McClaws further to the Confederate right to find and strike the actual location of the Federal left, while still maintaining contact with McClaws division on its left. As Hood reformed and prepared to advance, a few additional minutes were used up by way of a dialogue that ensued between Hood and, and Longstreet. Hood had sent out scouts to see if there was a way to move around the round tops to attack the Federal left and rear. Soon thereafter, Hood informed Longstreet the scouts had found an opportunity and requested permission to take his division further to the right and attack around the round tops. But the day was already late, and in a series of exchanges, Longstreet ultimately said was time was up, they must obey General Lee's orders and to attack at once. With that settled, around 4.30 p.m., Hood's division was sent forward and the battle commenced. In concluding on Lee's supposed intention to attack earlier on day two, I would simply ask, where in the sequence of events is Longstreet single-handedly delaying the Confederate attack on July 2nd? Furthermore, what of Longstreet critics' assertion that events would have turned out more favorably for the Confederates had the attack commenced around the 10 or 11 a.m. hours? Beyond totally discounting all the realities of the situa situation around that time, no Law's Brigade, multiple reconnaissance ongoing, Anderson's division not yet in place. Realistically, the federal line on Cemetery Ridge was already firmly established with Sickles left resting just north of Little Round Top. An attack made up the Emmitsburg Road at that time would then have progressed in front of multiple federal corps with Longstreet's right flank completely exposed. The last of Lee's alleged intentions we will touch on this evening is the claim that he wanted Longstreet to resume the attack during the early morning hours of July 3rd. Contrary to what has been written over the decades in several narratives of the battle, there's absolutely no proof that Longstreet received any attack orders during the overnight hours of July 2nd beyond a broad directive that the attack would be resumed the next day. Some scholars and historians have attempted to use some comments E.P. Alexander included in his 1897 memoirs, Fighting for the Confederacy, to prove Longstreet received specific attack orders in the night. A close inspection of the details that make up this particular account by Alexander, however, reveals they are not in accordance with what is known about Lee's initial plan for July 3rd, which is revealed in the commanding generals after battle reports. In short, Lee's first plan for July 3rd was for Longstreet to essentially renew his July 2nd attack using the Peach Orchard as an artillery platform and infantry launching pad against the federal left center on Cemetery Ridge. Hood's and McClaw's spent divisions would lead the attack once more, except this time supported by Pickett's fresh division. Alexander's fighting for the Confederacy account is not in harmony with Lee's official reports. Alexander essentially claimed he visited First Corps headquarters on the night of, the, of July 2nd and was told the attack would be renewed early in the morning with Pickett's division to the left of the Peach Orchard from the Confederate perspective. Alexander's other post-war writings, most notably his 1907 work, Military Memoirs of a Confederate, is completely at odds with his 1897 account. In Military Memoirs, Alexander made no mention 
visiting First Corps headquarters and really did not include any of the other details from his 1897 account, while also blatantly stated Longstreet, quote, Longstreet received no orders during the night, unquote. Coupled with Alexander's statement, Longstreet never once mentioned receiving attack orders during the overnight hours of July 2nd, even in his after battle report, which would have been reviewed and read by Lee. Instead, like Longstreet's several post-war accounts, he described using the overnight hours to try and find a different approach for renewing the offensive on July 3rd, namely by moving around the round tops and striking the Federals left and rear. Likewise, in Lafayette McClaw's post-war writings, he never mentioned receiving any information during the overnight hours about an intention to attack early on July 3rd. It stands to reason that McClaws, one of three division commanders who would have been heavily involved in the supposed early morning attack, would certainly have been informed, and yet McClaws lent no credence to this allegation. The next issue that Longstreet critics will run into when alleging that Lee intended to attack in the early morning hours of July 3rd is the 4.30 a.m. meeting between Lee and Longstreet on Seminary Ridge. A number of topics of conversation came up during this meeting. To include Longstreet's suggestion to move off the right and strike the federal left and rear. However, for purposes of our discussion here, the most important one is that Lee made it clear he intended to resume the attack in Longstreet's front using Hood and McClaws supported by Pickett. Longstreet then proceeded to inform Lee that Hood and McClaws were the Army's right flank and cautioned that if they were repulsed, the Federals might mount a counterattack and threaten the Confederates right and rear. Lee apparently agreed with this assessment, but then immediately pivoted to a backup plan, which was to use Pickett's fresh division and a division and a half from Hill's Third Corps to attack the Federal Center. In committing the army to this battle plan, Lee moved the attack point further north up Cemetery Ridge and fashioned an assault force from two different corps, effectively sealing the deal for a significant delay in executing such an attack that would require much more coordination and preparation. Ultimately, Lee, Longstreet, and to a lesser extent, Hill, would spend the rest of the morning hours preparing for this ill-fated assault, now most commonly known as Pickett's Charge. Last parting note on this particular alleged intention of Lee's. In contemplating this topic, one is left wondering what the reasoning would have been for Lee to rush an attack on July 3rd, launching it in the early morning hours essentially blindly. By this point, the Federal Army was completely up and their position had been reinforced and strengthened during the overnight hours. Saying the attack plan was unchanged from July 2nd is great, but that does not take into account changes on the Federal side of the battlefield. In all actuality, the federal position was much changed from July 2nd. In launching an attack in the early morning hours under the assumption everything was unchanged and without a comprehensive examination of the federal position on that part of the field would have been irresponsible generalship at best. In concluding this examination of some of the most persistent Lee intended arguments advanced by Longstreet critics for well over a century, it's worth noting that perhaps the best argument out there to discount the allegation that Lee thought he had been thwarted at Gettysburg <clears throat> because of Longstreet's alleged recalcitrance, sulkiness, or insubordination is that Lee and Longstreet continued their close relationship through the end of the war and beyond. Lee was very much reluctant to let Longstreet go west after Gettysburg and very much looked forward to his return to the Army of Northern Virginia in May 1864 just in time to play a consequential role at the Battle of the Wilderness. Longstreet was also welcomed back to Corps Command with open arms once he sufficiently recovered from his wilderness wound in October 1864. Then Longstreet was right by Lee's side when the Army of Northern Virginia surrendered at Appomattox in April 1865. Perhaps most poignant and revealing is a letter Lee wrote to Longstreet on January 19, 1866, just nine months after the surrender portions of which I will quote with no additional commentary as it speaks for itself. Lee wrote to Longstreet, quote, I'm delighted to hear that your arm is still improving and hope it will soon be restored. You are, however, becoming so accomplished with your left hand as not to need it. You must remember me very kindly to Mrs. Longstreet and all your children. 
I had while in Richmond a great many inquiries after you and learned that you intended commencing business in New Orleans. If you become as good a merchant as you were a soldier, I shall be content. No one will then excel you and no one can wish you more success and more happiness than I. My interest and affection for you will never cease, and my prayers are always offered for your prosperity. And with that, that uh, concludes my, my formal presentation. Just up here on the screen, um, just to mention to you some other opportunities if you, you wish to um, uh, check out my book. Um, I have hard copies, signed hard copies available on eBay if you would like a signed copy. And then also, obviously, on Amazon, uh, Kindle or hard copy, and uh, direct from the, the publisher as well there at mcfarlandbooks.com. And with that, um, I will take any questions that you may have this evening.